Welcome to the 2020 FH Global Summit. We're so excited to be with you today for the opening uh, session today. We have over 600 people that have responded to our invitation to, uh, to register, including many old friends, and we're excited to welcome many new friends and advocates. I am uh, Josh Knowles, the Chief Research Advisor for the FH Foundation and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Stanford University. Uh, I'm co-chairing this summit along with Dan Rader, the FH Foundation's Vice Chair and Seymour Gray Professor of Molecular Medicine and Chair of the Department of Genetics at the Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania. We will be joined today by our co-host Catherine Weilman, the founder and CEO of the FH Foundation, and Mary McGowan, the Chief Medical Officer of the FH Foundation and Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Uh, many, Mary divides her time between the foundation and serving as the co-director of the Lipid Clinic at Dartmouth Hitchcock Heart and Vascular Center. She's been the principal investigator on over 30 national and international clinical trials and has lectured widely in the United States, Canada, Europe, and Asia on cholesterol metabolism. She was the first chief medical officer of the foundation and we're glad to have her back serving in that capacity. While it is very challenging to be in a virtual format in the midst of this global pandemic, we also view this as an amazing opportunity to reach a global audience geographically, as well as a diverse audience of people affected by FH, their healthcare providers, and those that participate in the overall landscape of care in other ways. We do appreciate you taking the time to prioritize FH and commit and our commitment to preventing inherited cardiovascular disease among the many competing priorities that we have in these challenging times. This year we will convene one session monthly. We think of it as having breakfast or lunch or maybe even a midnight stack for those of you depending on where you are in the world with the FH Foundation and the global FH community. We're aiming to ensure that uh, most of the content fits within the first hour with ample time for questions and answers uh, at the beginning, which will spill over into, uh, at the end, which will spill over into the remaining time. We will record each session and make it available to the registrants, but we hope as much as possible uh, you can be with us live. To participate uh, in the discussions today, we invite you all to say hello to each other using the chat feature of Zoom, as indicated by this icon. Let us know whether this is your first FH Global Summit or how many you have attended prior. We will be dedicating 30 minutes to the moderated Q&A for each session. This is an opportunity to question the speaker and additional panelists. And although we're asking you to use the chat function to introduce yourselves, we ask that all questions and comments are entered in the specific Q&A function as shown by this separate icon on the screen. The FH uh, Global Summit Series would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. The FH Foundation would especially like to thank Aspirion for being a foundation level sponsor and all of our corporate sponsors here listed uh, for advancing the diagnosis and care of FH homozygous FH and lipoprotein A. So thank you very, very much. Finally, today is FH Awareness Day. FH Awareness Day was established by the FH Foundation in 2012 to raise awareness of FH worldwide. It is now celebrated all around the world and we're so proud that each year we reach tens of millions of people with messages about why FH cannot wait to be diagnosed and treated. <clears throat> Later today, indeed, immediately following the end of the summit at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll host our annual FH Awareness Day Tweetathon. Please join us by posting and following hashtag NoFH. And if you can't make it, consider posting a message or sharing one of the FH Foundation's posts on any social media platform. And now, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Catherine Wildman, who really does not need any introduction. She's the founder and CEO of the FH Foundation and, and ever the quintessential advocate for families impacted by heart disease. So Catherine, take it away. Thank you, Josh. I want to personally welcome everyone to the 2020 FH Global Summit. During this series of eight virtual meetings, we will celebrate some of the scientific breakthroughs that have occurred since the last time we met. Um, 
And I think everybody could use a little bit of celebration right now. Several of the sessions will focus on the nuanced role of genetics in heart disease. In our session today, we'll have the honor of hearing from Rob Hegley, who so many of you know personally, and even if you don't know him, if you're an individual with FH, your doctor may have gone to him and he may be somehow inextricably part of your care. He has graciously agreed to accept the FH Pioneer Award and we will hear from him shortly. We will dig into the ever mounting evidence that reduction of cholesterol directly translates to a reduction in cardiovascular disease. Future sessions will also cover the important topic of treatments that are currently available and who is receiving those treatments as well as novel therapies in the pipeline. Families with FH have historically played a large role in giving scientists a window into how LDL cholesterol drives the atherosclerotic process. Nobel prizes have been won. Incredible classes of cholesterol lowering therapies have been created. And our fight against cardiovascular disease, even more generally, has been greatly buoyed by the scientific insights garnered from studying the FH population. However, the reason that this meeting is so important and your participation is key is that the FH population has often been left behind once the learnings have been captured and the therapies reach the market. This is what we want to change and what we have to change. We know who is predisposed to illness we know what the mechanism of disease is, and we have the tools to stop it. That means prevention is possible. But the best medical care always hinges on an accurate and timely diagnosis. Today, nine out of 10 people born with familial hypercholesterolemia remain undiagnosed. Their children don't get screened and their siblings are unaware of the genetic condition that runs in their family. So not only will we focus on the exciting breakthroughs, but we'll also focus on the breakdowns. We'll look closely at how we might address the social and economic factors that often get in the way of evidence-based care. We will explore the application of behavioral economics to align clinicians, health systems, and patients as key members in their medical team. And we'll continue to hold ourselves as a community accountable for the specific and systematic disparities faced by Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians in the American medical system, at least. Our sessions will be filled, as always, with fresh voices and new data. And one of the things that makes this meeting unique is that you will hear in every session from the people who actually live with the disease. Our shared goal is to keep people from having their first heart attack and to stop people from having their second heart attack. And so we thank you for joining us in this work. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our co-chair, Dr. Dan Rader. Thank you very much, Catherine. <clears throat> it's great to be with all of you, and it's great to see so many people uh, calling into this first of our virtual summits. I am very pleased to present this year's FH Foundation Pioneer Award. The Pioneer Award honors and recognizes individuals who have contributed to furthering the scientific understanding and clinical care of familial hypercholesterolemia through groundbreaking research and pioneering efforts. This year's award is the sixth annual Pioneer Award. In the past five years, the FH Foundation has had the great privilege to honor the following pioneers. Avidus Kachadurian, who informed the familial basis and phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia, including describing the condition of homozygous FH. Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein, who perform, performed pioneering work in the discovery of the LDL receptor, and mutations in the gene as the basis of FH. 
Nanette Wenger, who has been a pioneer for advancing the recognition, diagnosis, and management of heart disease and its risk factors in women. Roger Williams, who was honored posthumously, known as the father of Cascade Screening for FH and for his work underscoring the need to prioritize FH as a public health concern. And last year, Catherine Bolau, who performed groundbreaking work in the discovery of the relationship of PCSK9 to FH. And today, we are especially proud to present the 2020 FH Foundation Pioneer Award to Dr. Robert Hegley. Dr. Hegley is Distinguished University Professor of Medicine and Biochemistry at Western University in London, Ontario, and is Director of the London Regional Genomic Center at the Robarts Research Institute. He holds the Wolf Distinguished Medical Research Chair, the Edith Schulich Vinay Chair in Human Genetics, and the Blackburn Chair in Cardiovascular Research. Dr. Hegley is a true pioneer in the genetics of lipid metabolism in FH. In 1981, as a medical intern, Dr. Hegley saw his first FH patient. In his own words, this helped motivate a career-long interest in lipids and lipid disorders. As a research fellow in 1986, he was among the first to apply DNA technologies in the diagnosis of FH. In 2013, his lab developed a targeted next generation DNA sequencing panel called LipidSeq for diagnosis of FH and other genetic dyslipidemias. As a result, he became the go-to person for lipidologists all over the world, including many I'm sure on this call, to send patient DNA samples for sequencing and molecular diagnosis. Dr. Hegley has discovered the genetic basis and improved our genetic understanding of over 25 human genes, including multiple lipid and metabolic disorders. He has published more than 770 peer-reviewed scientific papers and is widely recognized as one of the most accomplished geneticists in the world. Dr. Hegley is also an outstanding and committed clinician he currently cares for over 2,500 patients in his lipid clinic, including over 500 patients with heterozygous FH and six FH homozygotes. He was the first in North America to use five different medications that are now routinely prescribed to treat high cholesterol and diabetes. He has led efforts to develop international clinical practice guidelines for FH and other genetic dyslipidemias, as well as guidelines for cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes. He has trained many, many physicians, medical students, and graduate students, a large number of whom I suspect are currently listening in to hear his presentation. Finally, I'd like to add a personal note. I've known Dr. Hegley since I got my start in lipidology back in 1988. Meeting him at a Gordon Lipids conference, I was awed by his accomplishments even at that time. But he quickly became a good friend and someone I've turned to repeatedly for scientific advice and counsel related to my own career. I think everyone on this Zoom line who knows Rob, and I think that's probably most of you, will agree with me that he is one of the most genuine, kind, and collaborative individuals I have ever met. <clears throat> Despite his amazing accomplishments, he's remained humble and always interested in promoting the careers of others, regardless of their station in life. Rob, this FH Foundation Pioneer Award is to recognize your amazing scientific and clinical accomplishments, but we also recognize the incredible impact you have made on so many people. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> Great. Thank, well, thank you very, very much, Dan, and, and uh, thank you to the, to the FH Foundation. It's, a, it's an enormous honor, it's, uh, to, especially from this foundation, and especially on this day, uh, FH Awareness Day. So. Um, Thank you very much for this uh, recognition, which is truly humbling. I, I, uh, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And um, uh, yeah, so, so thank you. I'm gonna, gonna now share my screen and, uh, and uh, go, into my, uh, go into my presentation. So hopefully you can all see this. Uh, so um, I'm gonna be talking about DNA and FH and uh, so hopefully I, I don't have to spell it out. <laughs> These are abbreviations. So this is, uh, I'm trying to keep the title uh, concise. 
these are my disclosures. So to start, uh, some of you may be aware of this. So Leonardo da Vinci is one of the greatest uh, humans who walked the face of the earth was um, very observant. I mean, very, you know, just a, a great scientific mind and, and artist. And, uh, um, and there is this thought that even this, his most famous uh, work of art, the Mona Lisa, that there is a connection to FH, that if you look closely uh, in, around the left eye of um, La Gioconda, you can see a, a little xanthalasma there. So, you know, it makes you wonder, and uh, um, this might be one of the first uh, recorded um, diagnoses of, uh, of, of FH, at least on clinical grounds. So I'm going to be speaking about, about DNA, and again, to then, uh, just to put some context into it. Shakespeare said, it's not in the stars to hold our destiny, but in ourselves. And when I think of within ourselves, I'm actually thinking of within our DNA. So uh, DNA is not determinism. I mean, it's not our fate. In fact, as we as we'll see, or with some of the examples that I'll show, that it, it is uh, uh, definitely possible to overcome what is encoded in our DNA, uh, fortunately. Um, but, but in fact, um, but in fact, you know, we are defined largely by our uh, DNA. And when we look at, when we think of the stars, so th throughout history, uh, great artists, so this is Van Gogh, uh, Starry Night, um, the, the view of the view of the stars from a, from a, from a, a, a tremendous artist, a revolutionary artist. Um, but this is a, another starry night, a view of stars, but this is actually not stars. This is a, a DNA microarray. And every little speck on this star is actually a new fragment of nucleic acid that has lit up or been hybridized by a probe. And that uh, the, this is really no bigger than a cover slip of, of a microscope. But when we, when we look at it in this perspective, it does look like a starry night to me. And so the, the real question always with DNA research is that can we look at the DNA? Can we look at these uh, patterns of, of, that is within, our, within the patient's cell or within our cells and, and, and make predictions, make predictions then about the future, just as, as, Shakespeare, as Shakespeare said. Uh, predictions about health, well-being, and then also to, to intervene. Is there then something in here that identifies uh, something that, uh, that can be uh, ameliorated or, or intervened upon? And so that really since the, the first days that we could start measuring DNA, this is really what we've been trying to do. So DNA, of course, um, is stored on chromosomes and DNA as letters of code. I just want to give you a bit of a, an overview because all of the methods that I'm going to show you are really looking at the same thing. We're looking at variation in DNA and we're looking at variation between people and a lot of the time the variation has no consequence but some of the times uh, sometimes the variation is very very consequential and you know, can then lead to something like FH. So uh, when I first got started, and, and again, thank you, Dan, for, for, the, for the introduction. Um, so in the 1980s, this was sort of the view of FH. This was the textbook Harrison's, you know, Harrison's internal medicine view. It was a, a, a disorder, the heterozygous form, at least one in 500 people, it, uh, autosomal dominant inheritance. The LDL receptor had been discovered by the by the with the work of Brown and Goldstein, and then there was even ApoB as a second gene. So the 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 gene that makes the ligand for the LDL receptor that there that that had been identified as a second locus that could cause FH. And then of course there are the clinical features: the corneal arcus, anthelasmas, anthomas, early cardiovascular disease, aortic stenosis. The diagnosis was still largely clinical. The DNA was not used in those days as part of the diagnosis. And there were a few treatments, lifestyle diet, bile acid sequestrants, niacin, statins were just starting. Like I wrote my first uh, prescription for Mevacor in 1987. So this was uh, just starting to come onto, the, come onto the clinical realm. And then of course, apheresis, even in those days for, for homozygous FH. 
So if we look at it today in 2020, the, the, the view has changed, it's expanded, but in fact, there are still a lot of things that, that, that persist. So first of all, we know the prevalence through now uh, genome, these uh, sort of whole genome population screening surveys is actually more prevalent than we thought, maybe in the one in 250 to 300 range. We know that it, largely it's, it's still, we would think of it as autosomal dominant or autosomal co-dominant technically. Uh, with a lot of the causative genes are shown there now, PCSK9 was mentioned, there's some other genes, LDL receptor associated protein, and then some minor genes. But there's also this component of polygenic risk that I'm going to talk about a little bit. And in fact, a lot of patients that I see in clinic that are referred with familial hypercholesterolemia actually don't have a single gene mutation, but actually have this polygenic risk. And I'll discuss that a little bit later. Clinical features really remain the same. In fact, if anything, the diagnosis is made uh, earlier. We don't, we don't see some of these profound findings that we used to see in the 80s because, in fact, I think it's a good sign the patients are being identified earlier and patients are being treated better so that the big, you know, the very thick, the xanthomas and florid xanthelasmas and so on, that that's, uh, they, they seem to be less commonly ascertained clinically than, than was the case uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And, of course, now we, we can include DNA sometimes used strategically to make the diagnosis and then all of the new treatments uh, and then I didn't even mention the gene therapy here but uh, this is just a partial list of the, of the new therapy. So there has been progress over the last uh, 30 or 40 years in, in FH. So just a little bit of, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of you um, maybe would be thinking back to uh, undergrad courses in genetics or high school courses in genetics, but the point here is that we are, are our proteins, that the DNA provides the instruction manual for proteins, it's translated into the message, which is RNA, and then really then uh, it's the proteins, you know, the 20 or 25,000 proteins that then define us. And so if we, we, if, if we could look at proteins, if we could then use, uh, say, proteomics as a, you know, reliable screening tool to make predictions, medical predictions, we would be looking there. If we would look at RNA, we would do it. But, it, but as it turns out, there's a lot that we can look at now. In fact, DNA seems to be the easiest, uh, the easiest source for now. And, and in some ways predictable. And so, so DNA, you know, is helpful in terms of uh, looking for variation between people and, and making medical, you know, trying to translate that into medical decisions. So just as, as an example of the scale of that, so of course we have 3 billion letters of DNA code. So this is just a uh, 1,000 letters. So this is then say a part of a chromosome, this is actual DNA sequence. So we can imagine that these 1,000 letters here, and there's four, four letters of the DNA alphabet and all of the all of the amino acids, all of the information there to encode, uh, you know, a protein is contained within. It's not quite as riveting as, say, reading Harry Potter or something like that. For, for, for a geneticist, this is like amazing. Oh, C, C, A, C, G, mmm, T, A, T, mmm, very interesting. So, I mean, but not that, not that, not that riveting for a, for, for a non-geneticist probably. So this would be, say, from the maternal allele of, of, a, of a particular region of the genome. And then we have then the paternal allele and then the same region. And you can see that there's a lot, in fact, it's, you know, it looks identical, but I, but I can tell you that there's one difference here. There's one letter of difference between the two. And I, I can, you know, highlight it here that, that, that there it is. So in the maternal allele, it's you know, TCA, and in, and in the paternal allele, it's TGA. And so that one little difference, now maybe, maybe it's enough to cause, uh, uh, have a consequence. These differences occur every two to 300 bases along the DNA code. Uh, most of the time they are neutral, but maybe it is uh, sufficient to cause a difference. So cells have very little tolerance for these kinds of misprints sometimes. So, so the analogy would be, you know, if you are like, you know, entering into your GPS and you, uh, you then do a, you know, you misprint or you, you do a, a one letter entry error into your GPS and all of a sudden you end up on the other side of town because, you know, your, your GPS is just doing what you entered. So, so in the GPS cannot creatively problem solve, but can't tell when you've, uh, when you've entered a misprint. So the same thing with DNA, your cells cannot tell 
Uh, if there's so even a small difference that's seemingly so innocent uh, can, uh, can have a profound effect uh, at, at, at the level of the cell and what the cell is doing and the proteins that it's making. So that one way would be then to read the entire code, which is what we would try to accomplish with, say, sequencing strategies. Another way is that you can uh, kind of use a shorthand where you can distill the DNA down to these sort of barcode type patterns. You may have heard of these DNA barcodes. It's the same principle. So here on the upper part of the panel is the you know, maternal allele, paternal allele, and there is one difference between these two. And you, I, you can see it here with the arrow, this bar is missing. And so here, you know, you're at the grocery store, you scan this bar, you get green beans, and then you scan this barcode and you get alpha Getty, you know. So, 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 the, uh, so these differences, you know, you think, uh, well, you know, it doesn't look like it's that much of a difference, but in fact, these are, these are subtle differences that, that can make a difference at the level of, uh, of whole human health. You know, here one more example, okay, so here's like some genetic, here's some uh, English information, okay, using the letters of the English alphabet, so it's probably uh, appropriate for a talk about genes. So you can then take that same information and scramble it around, it's same letters of code, right, just the order is different, but, that, but then the message is entirely different, okay. So here, and as it turns out, Elvis is wearing jeans in this photograph. But you know the it, it's it's the example of how there are these uh, constraints on information. Small changes can make a big difference, and we are um, we are looking for these differences. So from the outset, we are trying to read the genetic code and find these differences that then may have a big impact later on. So DNA variation. Here, again, the same thing. Here's your stretch of DNA. There's that variant site that I showed you about. It could be an A, it could be a C. And so as it turns out, there are three kinds of human beings because there are people that would have inherited an A at that position from both parents or in their homozygous for A or a C at that position from both parents or the heterozygotes, one, one version of each. So all of a sudden, you wouldn't know it by looking at them necessarily, but there are three kinds of people in the world, you know, these three, by these three genetic categories. And then, you know, human curiosity being what it is, you start to ask yourself, okay, so for this particular genetic variation, is there some difference between these people versus these people? But the real key is being able to measure the variation. This is now yet another method to measure DNA variation on this plot. It's a uh, uh, tac man, uh, allelic discrimination. So just again, to, to make the point that these variants, okay, you, uh, so on, on a population-wide basis, you can look for these variants. They can be common, they can be rare. You, you then, you, uh, you get together your people, you collect saliva or blood from them, you harvest the DNA. There's a trait of interest, say LDL cholesterol, and it has this sort of distribution in the population amongst these people and you run your DNA method. So this is a gene chip, so a SNP array. And then you uh, can create these categories of people. And most of the time when we're doing it on a genome wide basis, there are no differences. The, the three categories have exactly the same level, say of LDL cholesterol. But if the gene happens to be, or if the, if the marker happens to be close to a gene or within a gene that is actually having an impact on the trade, say LDL cholesterol, then the, you, you see a statistical separation between the three kinds of people and you can test it statistically. And then this can be tested uh, on a, on a genome-wide basis. And so this is this whole principle of uh, you know, genome-wide arrays and genome-wide association studies. But, but it's the same principle for whether it's common variants or rare variants, okay? So let me take you back to 1988. So we have the, you know, we know that looking for DNA variation is potentially important as a scientific tool. So this was a, a study that I did, I did during my postdoc at the University of Utah. And this was actually developing a DNA marker for the LDL receptor gene. So you would recognize the LDL receptor gene as the causal gene for familial hypercholesterolemia. So the hope was that by identifying these RFLPs, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, which is like a precursor of the SNP the single nucleotide polymorphism. And, um, but then by identifying a variant, we would have a tool that then we could test 
DNA in families, for instance, and look at the co-segregation between the marker, between the RFLP, the DNA variant, and the phenotype of high cholesterol. So this is then what it looks like. So it's sort of a barcode. These are actually blots that I made with my own hands. I think if you ask now my students or my postdocs, they would say, oh yeah, those, those look like uh, Southern blots that Rob would have made. Uh, but, but anyway, we, with these tools, with these reagents that we developed, we then had a way of probing the LDL receptor and then we could go into families and, and, and then this was a primordial way. So of course now we do it with sequencing, but then this was a blunt instrument but it was a way of barcoding and, and looking for co-segregation linkage between the marker of the LDL receptor gene and the hypercholesterolemia phenotype. So this was a, a, an exam, I'm gonna show you an example of a clinical application of then being able to genotype somebody or to, to genotype the family with this marker uh, for, with hypercholesterolemia. And in fact, uh, it's kind of a quaint time because uh, the editor of this journal, the original title of this paper was Clinical Application of DNA Markers in a Utah Family with Hypercholesterolemia. The editor of the journal was not sure that the readership would understand what DNA was, so the, he asked us to spell it out. Could you please spell out? So it's like, Dia. so to me, like I, most people, I thought most people would know what DNA was, but anyway, it's kind of, uh, so here is this family, Utah Kindred 653, family with hypercholesterolemia. This is an eight generation family. And down here were the patients, and this was a family that we, we've studied together with Roger Williams, who, uh, who Dan mentioned earlier, and who was my uh, great uh, friend and, and mentor. And, and actually I'm working in FH and still working in FH uh, as a result of having worked with Roger uh, at the University of Utah. Um, so we were able, so the way these pedigrees work is the squares are males, the circles are females, and then you, you know, the, mate, the mating you can see, and then the, the children and the generation. So a, a solid symbol means that somebody who's affected with hypercholesterolemia and has the DNA marker for the LDL receptor, okay? And so, and, and it co-segregates, it's perfect. You know, it, it runs as like uh, every single person who has high cholesterol, so these are like LDLs of 300, so this is familial hypercholesterolemia, has the marker for the LDL receptor. So a real, a couple of then examples of clinical application. So here we have a four-year-old young boy, and his LDL was 183, and that's high. I mean, you would all agree that is high for a child. So then the question is, is his LDL high because, you know, he's got FH like everybody else or like, like a lot of his other brothers and sisters or others in the family. And so with the, with the DNA marker, we could unequivocally show that, no, he didn't actually inherit the variant version of the LDL receptor gene. So his LDL is high, but it's high for some other reason. He actually doesn't have FH. So um, um, and this, he'd be in his, his 30s by now. Um, so we, we see this again, we'll come back to this again. There's other ways that, there's other reasons that LDL can be high. Uh, another thing that we could do is that because these people in all these various branches of the family that are living today have the same marker, we can then go back into history and impute where the DNA variant came from, uh, who were obligate carriers in the pedigree. And, and it, it comes back to this couple in the second generation living in the late 1700s or born in the late 1700s. Uh, so one of the, some of the original pioneers uh, that, that settled in Utah. So this, from this couple, we don't know which one was the source of the LDL receptor variant, but it was one of these two. And today they have 100,000 living descendants. So after seven generations, there's 100,000 people. So a lot of, so this is not, not actually atypical for uh, families from Utah for, for, for many reasons. But what we could do is then impute, and we didn't have medical histories on everybody, but we did have, you know, uh, dates of birth and death. And these are, on this graph, these are all carriers of that LDL or carriers of the variant or imputed carriers of the variant based on their position in the pedigree. And what we can see is that, in fact, the, there were some people who were living in the 1800s who, despite the fact that they carried the LDL receptor variant, were living into the eighth decade of life. 
And now in the, say, the mid to late 20th century, there are people that are dying in their 20s and 30s with the variant. So we, uh, we don't have time to, to try to explain why this, is. so in, in genetics, this is called anticipation, where the phenotype of the subsequent generation is, becomes more pronounced or, or more severe than the preceding phenotype. And you may be able to think of what, you know, why, this, why this could be happening. You know, it could be other genes perhaps that are marrying in, or, or it could be, um, uh, what we think the most likely thing is actually the lifestyle and intake of dietary fat and physical activity. So even with this, even like before the pre-statin era, you know, we, we, we knew that, that, that there was a chance, even if you had FH, even if you had this variant, you were part of this kindred, that just from within the kindred itself, there was evidence that, uh, that perhaps with lifestyle, uh, that, that it would be possible to, um, to, improve, uh, to improve longevity. Here's another kindred, kindred 625. So this was another, this was a, a really interesting family. So once we had these DNA markers for the LDL receptor, we, you know, we could genotype, you know, lots of families in Utah, like literally hundreds or even like, I think we were into the thousands of patients that we were genotyping with this RFLP barcode method for the LDL receptor. So here, I just wanted to, to draw your attention to the person in the circle. So this person is a carrier of, a, of, a, of an LDL receptor variant. So, okay, so this is FH. So everybody else in the family has got, who, who has this variant, has got an LDL cholesterol of two, you know, between 240 and you know, 340. But this person carries the variant and their LDL is 125. And so like, what's up with that? What's going on? And so as it turns out, it's really interesting. So the mother in this family, patient 94, was the source of the LDL receptor variant and the high cholesterol. But the father had the opposite phenotype. The father had a variant in the ApoB gene that was resulting in a low level of cholesterol, familial heterozygous hypobeta lipoproteinemia. And we showed that through linkage with ApoB. So this whole branch of the family down here is, is, is hypobeta. And this was a mating then of, of, a, of a mother with an LDL receptor variant and high LDL, and a father with an ApoB variant and a low LDL. And, and so as it turns out, the reason that this woman, patient 137, has a normal LDL cholesterol is that in addition to inheriting the LDL receptor variant, she also inherited the ApoB variant. And that was acting to offset the effect of uh, the uh, receptor deficiency. And so this is, and, and in fact, there's even uh, an extension. So this is the way the drug mypomersin works. So in 2012, the FDA approved a medication that actually mimics the effect of the, on the low cholesterol branch of this family. That is the defect in ApoB that is, uh, in here it's because an intrinsic coding sequence defect in the genome, but then this, um, uh, antisense RNA, mypomersin, mimics it, get, you know, gives the same effect by pharmacologically. And, and this was the mechanism whereby the, the drug would lower LDL cholesterol in, uh, in patients with uh, an LDL receptor uh, defect, familial hypercholesterolemia. So th then we had, you know, we had like literally now thousands of people genotyped. So then this is the so-called MedPed criteria for FH. So uh, we could then genotype these people within the families. And then we had, uh, you know, clinical features. And we could then look, or is there any kind of correlation between, you know, what was then considered the gold standard, you know, a DNA, linked DNA marker and clinical features. And so there's things like, this table that shows that, in fact, if you are closely related, the, the, the closer related you are, the more closely related you are to somebody who is a carrier of an LDL receptor variant and with high LDL cholesterol, that in fact, the, the lower the threshold for making the diagnosis of FH. So you don't need as high an LDL level. Say if you're, say, a first degree relative, you know, maybe of age 20, an LDL of 240, say compared to the general population where it would be more stringent, where you don't have that family context, you don't have the DNA variant co-segregating, you know, in order to be more certain that this could be FH due to a monogenic cause, you're, you're, looking, at a, you're looking at a higher threshold biochemically to make the diagnosis. And then, and this was really then, uh, you know, because of Roger, 
uh, the, the, with World Health Organization and Viktor Bulizhenko, who was the, was the administrator from the World Health Organization then, uh, and this was very visionary at the time, uh, so again, spearheaded then by, by, by the late Roger Williams. Uh, so the WHO was at that time really focused on communicable diseases, so infectious diseases mainly, so HIV and malaria. Uh, but, but this was the first example, FH was the first example of a, of a human genetic disorder in which there was then this uh, concept that it, it, there could be uh, preventive strategies, and then Dan mentioned cascade screening and and the family-based strategy. So FH was a, was a role model. This is not maybe regarded as so revolutionary now, but but then this was um, this was was groundbreaking. And so I uh, so uh, thanks to Roger, I had been invited to participate in the first uh, in, in the first roundtable, and then of course in the second roundtable, tragically, uh, two days before, on the way to Geneva, it's flight a uh, Swiss Air Flight One One One. Uh, there was uh, actually a plane load of, 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 of medical um, of physicians and, and scientists that uh, that plane uh, crashed tragically off in the North Atlantic uh, and Roger was was on that flight and uh, so <laughs> the rest of us were were there in Geneva without our chair without our chairman and um, and we we went ahead and we were we con completed the work wrote the second report but it was really in uh, in memory of our of our colleague and leader, uh, uh, Roger Williams. So uh, I mentioned now rare variants. So, so the, the main way, so there are many ways you can get high LDL cholesterol, FH. So the classic way then is through a rare DNA variant. So here would be the, uh, uh, you know, a, a pedigree again. So um, here, both parents are actually heterozygotes. So you can see that then a quarter of their children by chance would be homozygotes, so the affected allele is shown in red and the mutation is shown with an X. So a, a quarter of children of a heterozygous, a, a mating of two heterozygotes would have normal alleles, uh, half of children would be heterozygotes, and then a quarter would be homozygotes. And so this is then the, the, the usual way in which homozygotes, uh, homozygous FH, and, and it's around, with the revised population estimates, homozygous FH is around one in, maybe one in one, one in 160,000 to one in 300,000. So not one in a million, but actually probably more prevalent than that. And the, these, this chromosome map then shows the, the genes that are primarily affected. So mainly the LDL receptor gene on chromosome 19, and then number two would be the ApoB gene, and then PCSK9 on, on chromosome one, and then for the autosomal recessive form, uh, uh, ARH or LDL receptor associated protein. So uh, when I came back to Canada after having finished my uh, my uh, postdoc in 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 the U.S., uh, I worked in a lip, lipid clinic, and in fact, it was thanks to Ruth uh, McPherson, who we will be hearing from later, that I actually got my job in the lipid clinic uh, at St. Michael's Hospital. And so uh, I was seeing patients with FH. And so I very, I, from a very, very early time, uh, it's really having DNA. I, I mean, I've been very fortunate that, that, I've, that I've had DNA. It's like second nature to me. The, 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 the DNA diagnosis is, is part of the clinical assessment, like from the outset. Like right now, uh, like in the last five years, everybody is kind of catching up and looking at DNA. But, but for me, it's, um, it's sort of intrinsic. Uh, it, it's just like, like part of the physical examination. Uh, so we've been trying to raise awareness. This was our Canadian uh, journal. We're trying to raise awareness of familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is a, a patient that I had when I first started working in my current clinic. So this was almost 25 years ago. So he was referred to me um, at the age of 34, and he uh, his, he was for it was for to prevent his second heart attack. His father and two uncles had had fatal MIs under the age of 50. At age 29, his family doctor noticed that his cholesterol was 410 and his LDL was 330. But uh, again, there was an, in those days, there was inertia. It was like, oh, well, well, but you're thin and you're in good shape. And so, you know, we don't need to do anything, you know. Uh, but then he had a, a myocardial infarction that almost killed him at the age of 33 and diffuse coronary disease and three stents put in. And then he went on to sort of broad spectrum anti-atherosclerosis treatment. And so then he consented to 
Uh, so these were his uh, very thickened Achilles tendons, and then, you know, the xanthelasmas, and then he's got, you know, the, the tendon xanthomas on the back of these. So he was really untreated for a long time. So we, we don't see this as much, fortunately. So, uh, the, you know, the treatment now is, is much earlier than the, uh, the corneal arcus around the eye. So uh, anyway, we, we, like I say, yeah, everybody who comes in, uh, you know, they, they sign a consent. And so pretty much we have a hundred percent rate of doing genotyping on everybody. So as it turns out, he's got a, he's got a, uh, he's a heterozygote for an intron and splicing, a splice donor site uh, mutation. This is exactly the same mutation that was in that Utah Kindred 625 that I showed you. It's the, exactly the same mutation. So there is, although this patient was from Canada and he's not LDS and, but, but you know, came from the British Isles like his ancestors. So, so there is some sort of remote relationship. But this is another thing is that when I see a mutation, like, I, like knowing what the mutation is, is like, I, I feel like I know you because I've seen this mutation before. And now I know something and I know how they responded to statins and, you know, that's a hard one to treat and you need to use multiple medications. And so we would kind of see the same thing here. And then on top of that, he had a high polygenic score that was driving his LDL to a high level. So I'll talk about that in the next few minutes. So he's got heterozygous FH plus strong polygenic risk. This is the actual DNA tracing that shows his, his sequence and his mutation. So it's right here. You can see these two overlying peaks, two different colors. So again, the, you know, the, the human body is very intolerant to this type of, uh, you know, typographical error. So it's the same thing if you then, you know, enter the wrong, if you make a typo in the website that you're entering, you go to a totally different website if you get anything at all. So even like one letter, you know, will make a big difference. So it's the same principle here. Um, and so I want you to then focus. So this is then the treatment of FH through the ages. So off all treatment, his LDL was 330. Statin alone, just focusing on the second column from the right. Uh, stat, uh, LD, uh, statin alone, his LDL was 80, uh, 195. Statin plus azetamide, 148. Above two with niacin, then the above three. And then of course, then he was one of the first patients that was uh, in the North, North American arm of the Rutherford study. So he received evolocumab. Um, I think he may have been the first North American patient to receive it. Anyway, and he's still on it now. Uh, so he's doing great. And so this is, but you can see that there's been whatever that is, an 85% reduction in his LDL with these, uh, with these treatments. So uh, just over my, over my practice, over my lifetime. Uh, so a hard to treat form of FH for a couple of reasons that then has responded uh, really well to treatment. And this is then, this is now the map of my patients. So here, this uh, center part, this is the LDL receptor gene. Each one of these letters is a different mutation in the LDL receptor. And so I feel like I don't know my patient unless I know their mutation. And then, you know, some mutations I see again and again. But the point here is that FH, it's not like, say, sickle cell anemia, where there's like one mutation that explains all the cases. Here, it's like everybody's got their own personal mutation. You have to be able to design a method that would detect all possible variants and not just in these single letter changes. So, you know, however many there are here on this slide, three or 400, but then there are, there are big changes as well. So there are copy number variants. So about in my clinic, about 10% of, so the majority of LDL receptor changes, 80 to 90% are the single letter changes that I showed you. But then there are a lot of these that are these, what I would call holes in your genes. So these uh, large scale deletions, where it's not just a single letter, but it's a whole chunk of DNA that has been blown out. And so here's a, a, a picture of that. So on the upper part of the slide, this would be the, the these uh, circles are indicating the normal the, the, the intensity of the normal two copies of the gene for, this, for the patient, the LDL receptor is in this blue area. And then here in red, you can see that there's a drop off in the intensity that for this sort of one third of the gene, this patient has only got one copy. So that, 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 so that whole chunk is missing from one allele. So from one parental allele, they're, they, so they're kind of only functioning on one uh, one copy of the gene for that uh, for that region, and in fact, there's probably no functional protein coming from there. Um, so, if we tried to sequence that letter by letter, it looks fine. Uh, you'd say, "Oh, yeah, both copies look fine," but you don't know 
that there is only one copy because the sequencing misses the forest for the trees. So you need a method that looks that would be able to pick up these large scale changes. So as it turns out, so my uh, grad student, Michael Iacocca, who's an amazing student. Uh, so anyway, this was his work that he basically found out a way that we didn't need to use a separate method to detect these holes in the genes that, that in fact you could do it from the same sequencing data that was detecting the point by point changes, you just needed a different computer algorithm. And so this was then his paper that showed where we were comparing the old tried and true method for looking at holes in genes, MLPA, multiplex ligation primer amplification, versus this bioinformatic analysis of the next generation sequencing data, the lipid seq panel. And we have like pretty good accuracy, 100%, 100%. So we then were able to dispense with this old method. So now our next generation sequencing data gives us information, not just on the little point by point changes, those little point mutations, but we can get these large deletions also accounted for. And it's an, like I said, 10 to 12% of my patients. The final thing now is these polygenic effects. So polygenic effects as the name would imply are multiple genetic variants that are adding up to contribute to a trait. So we really recognize this going back a while. Uh, this, I think this might be the first demonstration for LDL cholesterol of multiple genetic variants that are, now this is not, this is different from say a big mutation. So here you see the LDL receptor gene, but this is a common variant that just kind of slightly raises LDL by you know, a few milligrams per deciliter. It's not like the big dramatic mutation that abolishes the function of, of the protein from that allele. These are all common variants that each are having a slight effect and cumulatively they actually affect LDL, you know, to, to quite a large degree. So here's the idea is that they're, you know, during meiosis, male and uh, mom and dad, you know, the DNA comes together, that then there are these loci throughout the genome that are affecting LDL, but just on a small, like small effects, common variants with small effects. Now, some of the genes are the same as the big effect variants. So you can see the LDL receptor, but this is not an FH variant. This is a common variant that raises LDL by just like a fraction of a millimole. PCSK9, that's another FH gene, but this is a common, but in distinction, this is a common variant that slightly raises LDL. Same with ApoB. And then all these other genes. And then they're all kind of acting together. Now, on average, when, this, when these alleles get sorted at meiosis, you know, the, you'll, you'll get some that raise, some that lower, and it kind of balances out for the average person. But there's some people who are just unlucky. They're, they're like the people that when they play cards, all the, they just get twos and threes all the time. Or when they play Scrabble, they always get, you know, X's and Q's and, you know, Z's. So, so, um, so here, every single, at every single possible site where you could be inheriting a variant that slightly raises the LDL, that's what happened to them. It's just bad luck. Statistically, it happened. They're a minority of the population, thankfully, but every single little variant and in aggregate, it raises their LDL effectively into the range that they look like they have FH. They look like they have a monogenic mutation and then they get all the complications, you know, myocardial infarction and coronary heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So in my cohort, so, so, you know, we used to think, okay, then the people who have FH, so say here, if you focus on the right part of the slide, so this is then my, again, my, my patient population of FH, we look at LDL levels above 190. So um, if we take a, a high polygenic score, say being the top 10th percentile of the distribution, it's about 11% of the population. It's what we would expect. If somebody has a, is positive for the mutation, that's what we see in the general population, is that 11%, if we take the 10th percentile, it's, it, it's almost perfect. It's like 11% of people have a score that high. But it, when we look in people who are referred with FH, but they don't have a big time LDL receptor monogenic mutation, but three times as many as you would expect have this polygenic variety where it's a bunch of little variants all kind of acting together to push their, F, to push their LDL into that range. And, um, and so we, you know, we broke this down in the clinic so that you say of, of all the cases that were referred with LDL over 190, about half of them have the, in red is the big monogenic mutation and then in blue is this polygenic form. So it looks like LDL is very severe, 
But, and, and in fact, um, it doesn't inherit in families because it's not a single gene. It clusters in families, but it doesn't follow Mendel's laws. And then a lot of them are still undefined. So that's the topic for future research. But, when, but if we are more stringent, if we take an LDL above 300, then pretty much everybody is, everybody with an LDL of 300 or more has got one of these large, you know, large effect rare mutations. And then there's some with the, with the polygenic, the blue, and then some other rare forms. But, but, and so this is all now done on this instrument. So we can look at, so the, so the advantage of our panel is that we designed it so that we can look at rare variants, we can look at common variants, we can look at holes in the genes, it's sort of one-stop shopping. A lot of what's offered commercially yet, I mean, they're starting to look at uh, polygenic, but I don't think a lot of them really know how to interpret it properly or they're, I've seen it misinterpreted. Uh, so we have to be careful. So as it turns out, FH, rather than being a simple genetic disorder, is actually a complex, uh, more complicated than we thought. And so here is my sort of my final concept that I wanted to present to you. So here are two people with LDL above 190. So this one is positive for like a monogenic mutation, the L, like the LDL receptor mutation. Here is somebody with 190, but there's, they don't have a mutation, okay? So if we look in the general, if we screen the general population, one in 300, so this is then just from say the, uh, you know, the Regeneron, the Geisinger data. So about one in 300, you know, will have an FH mutation and LDL above 190. Uh, another 14 will have LDL above 190, but won't have a mutation, okay? So you would think that all of those would be polygenic, but in fact, it's not. It's only about half of them, maybe you're 40% of them. So it's not everybody. So there's still something else going on. But, but the, of the ones that are referred to my clinic where they've seen a doctor and somebody has thought, oh, this patient could possibly have FH, by the time they come to my clinic with an LDL of 190, it's that graph that I showed you before, that pie chart. Half of them have a monogenic mutation. The other half then are something else, like it's polygenic often, but not always polygenic. There's something else going on. So it's different. This is the difference between using DNA in a sort of agnostic population screening way versus using DNA when there has been a, a the step of medical uh, thinking and medical diagnosis. And so here, this is now the, the, the last point that I wanted to make, and I'm sorry that I seem to have gone too long, but I apologize, but this is really the last clinical point that I wanted to make. So these, the, this is then the attributes of the two kinds of patients. LDL above 190, FH mutation positive, one in 300 in the population. And from the work of, of Amit Kara and, and Sek Katharaysan, we know that they've got about a 20 fold risk, 20 fold increased risk at least of early atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And then if we look in their families, because it's a single gene, we're going to find a lot of other cases, you know, maybe even like it's going to be a high success rate of finding other patients. And it's largely the LDL receptor gene and then a couple of other genes. But, the, but, but then in terms of what you do, you, you are still treating them based on the LDL elevation, right? The intensive guideline LDL reduction. Now, look at the other kind of patient. Then the patient who's got a high LDL looks like they have FH, but they don't really have the single gene version of FH. More common in the population, 120, just high LDL. Let's call it high LDL rather than FH because the mutation is negative. They still have a high risk of cardiovascular disease. Sixfold, there's nothing to sneeze at, you know. Like I don't, I would say we wouldn't like treat them any less seriously or any less intensely. And in fact, because these rare, these common variants cluster in families, if we screen family members, we're going to find other people that will have, it's not going to be as high a yield as with the single gene, but there's still going to be other family members that have it. And we've shown that about 20 to 40% will have a high polygenic score, however you define it. But the bottom line is you still treat the LDL. So at the end of the day, between the two classes, what, what is really different? So did, you know, and so, so now we've gone from having to explain to journal editors what DNA means to finally, we, this is from the earlier from the National Lipid Association, uh, you know, guidelines for the use of genetic testing in dyslipidemia and here in the bottom right hand corner, we see that FH is sort of front and center for that is like the poster child 
for monogenic, but then, you know, we have to consider polygenic as well. So this has really been revolutionary when we've gone from, you know, uh, RFLPs and ghostly images to now that this is part of, uh, there's actually position statements and, uh, and guidelines. So here's my last slide. And again, I apologize for running too long. But FH genetics is complicated. I hope I've shown you that. Now, I, DNA testing, I think, I, I, I can't, I mean, I cannot look at my patient without no needing to know their DNA. It, it aids me in diagnosis. It aids me with treatment. I feel like I know my patient better. Guides management, guides prevention strategy. I think it, yeah, we, we've shown, others have shown, that it increases uh, patient compliance if they know there's a discrete cause and motivation, and then it provides incentive to do cascade screening. But here's the bottom line for you. After it's like 35 years of work, 40 years almost of working on DNA, it's the LDL level. So it's not the mutation status, it's the LDL level that guides treatment. So thank you very much for this honor. And, uh, and again, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Rob, thank you so much. That was amazing and really um, terrific to see the evolution of the field uh, through your eyes and your insights into where we're going from here. So um, we're now going to move to a um, discussion panel and Q&A. And before we get started with questions, I'd like to introduce uh, a, a member of the panel, Dr. Ruth McPherson. Uh, Dr. McPherson is director of the Lipid Clinic at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and herself uh, an internationally known lipidologist and geneticist. Dr. McPherson received her PhD from University of London, that's the London and UK, uh, and, um, and her MD and subspecialty training in internal medicine and endocrinology and metabolism at the University of Toronto. She held academic positions at University of Toronto and McGill before coming to University of Ottawa Heart Institute in 1992. Dr. McPherson has held continuous peer-reviewed funding for multiple agencies and has published over 260 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. Her laboratory research is centered on understanding the genetics and genomics of complex phenotypes such as obesity and coronary artery disease. She directs the Lipid Clinic, the Atherogenomics Laboratory, and Ruddy Canadian Cardiovascular Genetics Center at the Ottawa Heart Institute and is a key Canadian and international opinion leader in the area of clinical lipidology and cardiovascular risk reduction. Ruth, it's great to have you here as part of our panel, and we really look forward to chatting with you and, and Rob uh, about uh, many of the questions that are coming up uh, in the spirit of Rob's talk. So, um, um, so I think we'll, we'll get started, and I, I think I'm going to try, we've had a bunch of questions come in, I think I'd like to try to organize the Q&A around a couple categories. One has to do with kind of the, the diagnosis and risk assessment uh, within FH, another around kind of therapeutic interventions. And then um, Rob, if you don't mind time permitting at the end, I'm gonna come back to um, asking you a few questions about your career and lessons learned, particularly for a lot of the, the junior people and people who are still evolving their careers who are on this call. So um, maybe I'll start with something, uh, Rob, you touched on at the end, which is this issue of the fact that many people who appear to have phenotypic FH don't have a, a documented single gene mutation. And many, but not all, have polygenic hypercholesterolemia. So at the end of the day, um, do people who look like they have FH clinically, but don't have a, a specific gene mutation, should we be calling people like that FH? Should FH be the diagnosis? I'd love to hear your thoughts and then maybe Ruth, you can chime in. <clears throat> yeah, so I think for simplicity, Dan, maybe, but then, you, so then I've heard people say, you know, um, you know, polygenic FH or, so, so you know, it's, it's definitely it's hypercholesterolemia. And um, yeah, so you, polygenic hypercholesterolemia, I mean, we would need to, we would need to rethink the nomenclature, I think. Uh, so Amit, Kara, and I had an editorial in circulation a couple of months ago where we're, I, so I think as a result, I mean, the, 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 genetic, the genetic information is forcing us to, as it is for, for, for many conditions, many classical genetic disorders, it's, it's forcing us to, to reconsider it. Um, so that might be the shortest answer. Ruth? Rob, wait, I, I don't know this. 
but it's a slightly lower risk, albeit very high, in patients with polygenic hyperperfusion. Is that because the age of onset is later? Obviously, in, in um, FH, we think of you know, diagnosis in cord blood, but uh, I wonder if there are any data at all on the age trajectory of cholesterol in those individuals. Yeah, so that that's being looked at. So, so I think that the short answer is, you know, we um, the, you can still see the polygenic effects in, in childhood, like where that's been looked at in children ch children studies, but they are, you know, so much more nuanced. So it seems like they do become uh, more amplified with with age. So that's there's probably you're you're probably right about the age effect. Um, the other thing is that then, you know, we're, we, when you break them down, even in the clinic, that the, they're the polygenic ones, the ones, uh, they always have a, they're like a millimole per liter less with LDL compared to the overall group uh, that have a monogenic mutation. If you just take all comers with a monogenic mutation and then all comers that we, you know, however you define polygenic, it, the phenotype is always slightly milder with, uh, with polygenic, at least biochemically. But they respond as well. So we've looked at it. They seem to respond just as well to statins in terms of percent reduction. They respond just as well to PCSK9 inhibitors. You know, there's, uh, the monogenic is starting from a higher level, but for, on a percentage basis, it's exactly the same. So um, it still ends up being, you know, a, you know empirical, empirical treatment. I mean, you're still treating through a target LDL and you're still titrating the patients. So we're not quite at the point yet where you can predict therapy based on monogenic versus polygenic. So related to that, and the uh, other question, oh, go ahead, Ruth, yeah. please. Yeah. One last polygenic. So uh, if you run a gene ship, of course, you can do a polygenic risk score for everything. Right. And a polygenic risk score for coronary disease, of course, right. takes into account millions of genetic variants that don't affect, you know, lipids or any other traits. Is yeah. there a role for that? Because obviously we can predict cardiovascular risk beyond what we know about conventional risk factors. And that may be particularly important in patients who have uh, FH or simply have severe hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, 100%. Yeah. So, and I know, yeah, you know, Dan is interested in this. A lot of people are looking at this again. So like, you know, uh, Saik and, and, and Amit Karam, like many, many people are looking at it. But um, so within FH, even if you then, yeah, so the coronary, I think, yeah, the, the, the large scale coronary risk polygenic scores would be hugely, it would be, and, and there are some data to, to show that that's, that that's actually the case. But, but even like, you know, things like LPA, smoking, so traditional risk factors. So those are also super important for, for FH. And if you have like two or three traditional risk factors, like diabetes on top of having FH, well then already the, the, then, uh, you know, your risk is higher. So we need to be, you know, the, without having to do a DNA testing. But yeah, but I think then if, yeah, if these if people can ever agree on a consensus of what one of these big omnigenic scores should look like and then create, you know, standards around the world for how they should be measured. And so there's like, yeah, that then that certainly should be part of, uh, part of the assessment of patients in the future. So while we're on this topic, Rob, you know, familiar partial hypodystrophy, you found one gene and then a second gene, and now there are, I don't know how many, but you've discovered most of them. So my question is for FH, are there other genes lurking out there? I mean, is it just, do we just need to look harder in these people who have FH who don't have a mutation, one of the known genes, and are we going to find more even if they're rare, or have we, are we pretty much now saturated and after that it's all polygenic and other, other, other factors? <laughs> I, I, I think we have. And so the reason I say that is that, um, so with the, the, the people have actually done those experiments um, and then what they, what they find are, you know, these individual cases, but it's something then like a, a, a weird expression of an APOE, you know, the, the 167 deletion, which is like normally causing another kind of phenotype, you know, uh, uh, but, but yeah, in some, in some families, and then Catherine Boileau found this and Sake found this as well. That, that it causes, it looks like FH. And, and the same with then, you know, lysosomal acid lipase is that you, there are some paid families. And, but, but then the, the example would be STAP1. So STAP1 then seemed to be from the whole genome approach in 2014, that seemed to be like a really new gene, like for autosomal dominant FH bona fide and so on. But then uh, did not, you know, as time went by, uh, did not pan out. And it looks like it may not be a gene. 
So, and, and that was maybe our best hope. So, uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not excluding the possibility that there may be other genes, uh, and, and, but, but I think it's, and it's going to be something else. So like, there's still something that is not explained by our canonical genes and rare minor genes and then polygenes. There's still patients that have high LDL that's not explained by those things. So there, there is some other mechanism. But um, Bruce, do you, do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Pro probably sure. not. No, probably not any 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 other major new gene discovery. Yeah, I think, oh, I think yeah, we've got enough yeah. from sequencing that it seems yeah. unlikely. But yeah, yeah. So can I ask a question about gen clinical genetic testing, Rob? You basically said. You know, it's part of your physical exam, essentially. <laughs> um, on the other hand, in the U.S., um, we don't have as much of that tradition. Um, we, you know, some of us are really promoting it, at least offering it to patients. But what we know is there's a, there's a lot of nervousness in the U.S. about it. There's nervousness about, even though Gina theoretically protects certain things, there's nervousness about life insurance and disability and um, and so uh, in your view, one, is that an issue in Canada? Do you know of cases where people have been discriminated against as a result of being tested for FH? And then second, um, well, I guess, is it a theoretical issue or do we know of situations where that really has, has actually come, come to pass? <clears throat> right, so well, so in, so in Canada, we're sort of fortunate that we have universal health care covered. So nobody, there's no pre-existing condition. So, we have, so nobody would be then denied so, but with life insurance, I guess it's potentially it's a different story, but I can relate a few anecdotes. So I've had patients with FH that have been coming to my clinic that have been resistant to go on statin therapy. Uh, and we, you know, we have their mutation having reported and then they go for, they try to get life insurance. And then the life insurance company tells them they're not going to get coverage unless they go on a statin. And that becomes their motivation. <laughs> like not, like everything that I've been telling them for 10 years, so, so it does work the other way around as well. So I think, uh, you know, especially for something that is, you know, uh, preventable and we have like such good evidence uh, for FH. So it, the answer to your question is I'm not aware of, of in my experience that, that there has been any deleterious outcome from somebody knowing that they have FH. Now, there are sometimes situations within families and family you know, families don't always get along, and there there is those kinds of issues. But but in terms of insurance, um, but I don't know, Ruth. What have you said? What's your What's been your? Yeah, no, I would echo that. The, the insurance companies go by the numbers, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's often a great motivation to get patients to to do all sorts of things, stop smoking, as well as treat their cholesterol. So yeah. certainly yeah. in Canada, that's not been an issue, but it may be south of the border. So Ruth, can I, a lot of questions about LP little a, both of you have mentioned it briefly. Um, my questions are, should every patient with FH have LPA measured, even though we can't really do anything about it right now, maybe sometime? And how does it actually impact on your clinical management of a patient with FH when you know that they have a high LPA, for example? <clears throat> right. Well, like our guidelines in Canada, they're certainly being revised. We're now recommending that, that everyone, you know, FH or not, have LPA measured once in their life, usually, you know, the first adult with the screening, because it does add to risk predictability irrespective of other risk factors. And certainly for patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, very important. We have that much older work from the 1980s showing that patients who have a high LPA and FH develop coronary disease one decade earlier. So yes, I think it is important. It's it's one of the one of the easily measured um, genetically determined markers that that really is different. You agree, Rob? Oh yeah, totally. I I you know I I think LPA and so then you know how do we use it? So if I you know so for certain everybody with FH should, or everybody who comes to lipid clinic should get an LP little A determination. And so yeah, so then that's the patient that should be you know their risk is is amplified. So, some sometimes I mean. So, so, Sometimes they're, um, it's a minority, but sometimes their FH is actually due to the fact that their, their LP, the mm -hmm. cholesterol in the LP little a fraction is so off the scale that it's actually kind of an artifact almost. But yeah, um, but, yeah but then the other thing, of course, is we have a new, there are, there are new biologics coming down, coming down the pipeline. We, be, we would be able to test the, test the hypothesis directly. But. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
Ruth, you've done a lot with corneal calcium scanning. I'm wondering about your uh, view specifically of the utility of corneal calcium scanning in, in FH. Um, is it worth it? Well, you know, it's so age dependent. So, you know, I think we tend to use coronary calcium scoring more in these sort of older middle-aged individuals where you're not sure whether or not they should be treated. I'm not sure in FH it's all that important. Of course, these patients do develop calcification, not only of their arteries, but also of their uh, aortic valve and, you know, echocardiograms can be quite useful. But I think coronary calcium scoring is more for the general middle-aged to older population rather than for, for FH per se. And I have young patients wanting a coronary calcium score. I tell them, that's not tell us anything at the age of 35. It's uh, really, it's exactly. much later. So um, sometimes it's appropriate to do full imaging, yeah. Uh, one of my concerns about coronary calcium scanning in FH is, especially in the younger patients, it often is actually low or yeah. zero, and it, it maybe gives a false sense of security. So um, yeah, I would agree with you. I'm not a, not a big fan. Um, so why don't we turn to a few questions around ther therapeutics? And um, one of the questions we got is the issue of the use of PCSK9 inhibitors, antibodies, in children. Um, I wonder if either one of you want to kind of address your, your view of that and where, where that stands. <laughs> Well, of course, there was the, like the Hauser trial that was just reported uh, like a couple of weeks ago. So I think that was... Evolocumab, right? Evolocumab, yeah. 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 And that, that was, uh, so anyway, that showed at least over, a, a, you know, an intermediate length of time. Uh, so the kind of efficacy that you would expect and, you know, no, no significant safety signals at all. So I think that, is, you know, breaks some ground in terms of the, of the you know, the use in that in that, uh, in that demographic, you know, the, so uh, I, I, my prediction is that, that it's like, you know, would be like anything. It would be like the way sort of statins in children were maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, that there will be, as there's more comfort and familiarity and, and accumulated clinical trial evidence that this would become uh, another uh, option for some, uh, for some children with, uh, or in children and adolescents, I think maybe more and more adolescents with uh, with age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's so contingent on the patient because many patients with FH, heterozygous FH, you can achieve LDL levels that are much lower than the population mean just with the higher doses or appropriate doses of a statin or thetamide. So it. It, I would say it's really necessary, but there are patients with heterozygous FH that have LDLs in the range of homozygous. So even a 15-year-old who's running around with an LDL still uh, 250 and everything else, then sure, one might consider it. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about children, by the way, um, one question we had had to do with the success of cascade screening in Canada. Um, is, is it um, effectively done? We know that in the U.S. it's not. Um, uh, just curious about the experience in Canada and whether you have any insights or, or thoughts about trying to improve the ef efficacy of cascade screening. <clears throat> um, well, I know in the in the, pro the province of Quebec, so there is actually greater awareness, and I think that that they are a little more systematic with uh, cascade screening uh, in Quebec. But I think for the rest of Canada, it's extremely it's a real patchwork and real hit and miss. Um, so we, we, and then, you know, the problem is, you know, in a, in a you know, the families are, sometimes they're just small families, sometimes it's the only patient. So we've been just reaching out. Not everybody has a good relationship or contact with their, with their parents. It's the usual limitations on, on cascade screening. Um, so what, what's, what's the, what's it like in Ottawa, Ruth? Yeah, well, we have the same difficulties, even though we have a genetic counselor, you know, you have to have agreement from the family to approach other members, et cetera. So uh, with my patients, I, you know, I always emphasize that first degree members have to be screened, et cetera, but you can only go through so far and often it's the family dynamics that get in the way. Yeah. And, and um, pediatric screening, uh, uh, just screening of kids, um, is that actively done uh, in Canada? Not, not cascade screening, well, but sort of routine yeah, not screening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in Ottawa, there's a very good uh, clinic at the at the uh, children's hospital, and uh, you know I get 
those patients once they're 18. So they actually do a pretty good job of, of screening and then, you know, picking up these individuals, but they really have to have been referred by a primary care physician who has questioned the parents and sort of understands that this is a genetic problem. So uh, I still think we're missing a lot of them. Yeah, I, I'm definitely getting referred more children for sure, say compared to 10 years ago. So I would say yes, but I, you know, what the denominator is or you know how pervasive or what, whether it's a standard practice, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing about cascade screening, so so I, I mentioned this. So if we do, we, like we've actually looked at it, you know, relatively small scale. So with cascade screening, with the monogenic version, we find that about 50, 50 or sixty percent of the time, we'll find another person, even in a relatively small nuclear family. So if we screen, say, three or four other relatives, it, there's a, a better than 50-50 chance, maybe sixty or even you know higher percent that we'll find someone else that's got FH. But, but we find the same thing with polygenic. So we, we, we find that in fact, you know, it's not quite as high, it's not over 50%, but it may be 30 or 40%. So we do find additional cases of high LDL. Um, and that's then because, you know, if these SNPs, you know, these, uh, you know, poly, if they aggregate in families, so just statistically, you know, it's not gonna inherit according to the laws of Mendel, but it still will, will cluster. So it's still worth, it's still worth screening family members. Um, we have uh, about five more minutes. So I'm just going to ask you first an open-ended question. What do both of you see in terms of the future of FH? Like if you look so over the next decade, what do you see happening that's really important for our listeners to, to know about in terms of your crystal ball? <clears throat> Rob, Rob, I'll let you start. Okay, thanks. So I well, I think uh, so. I th I think there's going to be you know even you know greater you know so these longer term uh, and more efficacious treatments, even the some of the biologics that are now being uh, tested in clinical trials. So the the, the, lo the longer acting uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. There's even new classes of drugs. You know, the Evanactumab and AngiPTL3. These are for, for homozygous, these are, the, I mean, the evanactumab is just an amazing, uh, just an amazing uh, drug. So, so I, I think it's, uh, it's, I, I think the, the, the news is good in terms of um, uh, just new, more, more additional therapeutic options uh, that will be, uh, that will be available. And the other thing, of course, is we just need to reemphasize the importance of prevention. So even just very basic things, you know, diet, exercise, all of that, that's still the foundation of, um, Management, no matter uh, no matter how high tech we get with our treatments. Good. Yeah, I think the most important thing is really the awareness level among primary care physicians, because uh, you know here at the Heart Institute, I like Rob see this thirty three year old come in with an acute MI, who turns out his father had early heart disease, but you know the family doc had hadn't even thought about screening because this guy looks so healthy. So I think more awareness among primary care physicians and more understanding of, you know, an LDL at a certain age is, is well above the 95th centile and this individual may well have a genetic dyslipidemia. Sort of, you know, as we know, the earlier you treat LDL, the better the outcome in terms of mortality and morbidity. And, you know, we can't wait until the patient is 50 to start treating, to start screening and start treating. So I think it, there's still a lot of education to be done out there that uh, we've, got, we've got a ways to go, I think. And do you think it makes a difference to actually make the diagnosis of FH to, to say specifically, I think you have FH and yeah. here are the implications of that? <clears throat> no, I think, you know, if LDL is elevated, you treat it. You don't wait to treat it. You treat it. <laughs> yeah. with, the drugs, with the drugs we have that are not expensive and you see available. Yeah. But, um, you know, we haven't talked about statin intolerance. So we also have the problem that our patients that require primary prevention, preventive treatment, you know, they are bound to determine that they can't take this or that. So that's, that's something yeah, else no, that we- cert Certainly an issue and yeah. certainly great to see new things come, come into yeah. the armamentarium mm -hmm. that really does allow us to, to manage those patients who can't take statins for sure. Um, we did have a question about genome editing and application of genome editing to therapeutics for uh, FH in particular. I think um, what I'm going to do is instead of asking you to answer that, let everybody know that we have a session on that, February 17th. Kieran Musunuru is going to specifically talk about really exciting new efforts in focusing on genome editing. 
in the context of treating hyperlipidemia and preventing heart disease. So I'd encourage everyone to put that on their calendar. And instead, I think, Rob, I'd love to end with um, a, more of a kind of personal career-based uh, question. And that is, um, you've been so amazingly successful despite um, being collaborative and good and not the classic sort of clawing your way to the top. So I, I'd love if you, could you give maybe a few examples of like really formative experiences for you and also then how that translates into advice you might give for folks who are on this call who are still at the earlier stages of their career who want to grow up to be a, a Dr. Hegley someday. Um, oh, no, I, I'm not <laughs> sure that's like a uh, you know, thing to aspire towards necessarily, but but I think for so for me, I had like really good role models at at, at critical stages, you know, in in medical school, and so these were, um, I think that that was very that was very very formative. Um, I've I've looked at it. I suppose if I you know if my if if I had been different, I mean I, my my metrics might be I don't know it's hard to say maybe my metrics might be twenty percent higher or thirty percent higher than what they are now. But you know it's still I mean at the end of the day you know it's still you know I was what's most important to me is my is my patient. So so in fact I've I've sort of used the re research as a as a means to keep up to date. So, so that I can offer my patients the best, um, you know, the sort of leading edge therapy so that to be up to date on research, you kind of have to have a foundation of what already exists, knowledge that already exists and kind of on the precipice of what's coming. So, 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 that, so that's really the foundation. It comes back to the Hippocratic Oath, I think. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. Well, that's, that's great. That's inspirational, Rob. And thank you uh, again for sharing your, your thoughts with us, for giving a fantastic lecture, and uh, for you and Ruth for both participating in a really informative Q&A. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody for attending today. Really great to see everybody. Uh, I hope you can join us for our second session. Our second session um, will be October 19th. Uh, at the same time, 12 Eastern US, and it's entitled Unlocking the Potential of Precision Health for Diverse Populations. We're really excited about this session and really hope you can all join us. I also want to remind you that in honor of FH Awareness Day, we're going to be having now uh, a tweet-a-thon, uh, so please join us on Twitter if you're able uh, for that. And um, finally, I'd really like, again, to thank our amazing sponsors. We simply would not be able to put on programs like today's uh, without them. And thank you very much, all of the sponsors, for allowing us to do this type of program. With that, uh, I'll thank everybody again for participating. Uh, thank our uh, Rob and Ruth for um, uh, sharing their wisdom with us. And again, we hope to see you uh, the next time on October 19th. Bye-bye.